ISD. I'm Carrie Perales. I'm Holly Horton. I'm Randy Jones. And, and we're getting, getting to, to the, the core. core. Thank you so much for being here today. I'm super excited that you're here. Um, we're going to be talking about belief number one in the math framework, which is about uh, the balance between procedural and conceptual. So I thought first, before we get into that, let's talk about like, what does it really mean to be balanced? I started to think, man, you know, life in general is about balance. Uh, I'm a wife. I'm a, a mother of two boys. Uh, and then I'm also an IT director. And there are times where I'm doing awesome at work. But when I'm awesome at work, I'm missing something that my kids are doing. Or I could be doing awesome with my kids. And then my husband feels left out. And so balance is really hard. Do you all have the same experiences? I... um. I have an analogy that I use. I call it watering the grass. Ah. And I think um, as a math person, once you identify what water you have to give, then you have to choose where you water your grass. Oh, I and love that. so I am very aware, not each day as I should be, but maybe each week of have I watered my professional grass enough? Is my children's grass? Is the husband's grass? Like it's all. It's all maintaining the lawn, and sometimes it's overwhelming to think about, but then it's a good accountability system. To oh, know I love that, every, that. Everybody needs a little water. Oh, I love that, Holly. Thank you for sharing that. So I have to make sure that my grass is at least partly green. <laughs> they always say the grass is greener where you water it. Yes, okay. Once you take control of the water, then you can have green grass everywhere. Not fully green, but green tint. Green tint. There you go. I love it. Randy, what about you? Um, it made me think, when you were talking, when both of y'all were talking, it made me think of um, the saying, all things in moderation. Mm. Um, I'm a reader, and I love to read. And we always, as a teacher, as an English teacher especially, I think, oh, that's a good thing. But my husband would not agree. Um, <laughs> because when I start a book, I don't do laundry, I and do I rice. don't cook. Like, I get involved in the book. And so he would say... You read way too much. And to an English teacher, you can never hear right. that. Wow. But I think there's a balance. I have to find a balance because mm -hmm. I, can't, I can't read when I need to be doing work or cooking dinner. Yes. Awesome. I love that. You guys are amazing. So then it makes me go, okay, so balance is hard, but you guys both had some great solutions. Mm -hmm. um, so how are we balancing the curriculum and how are we supporting our teachers so they understand the need for a balance of conceptual and procedural math? Who'd like to start? I'll start, okay. and, and I'll just say um, the reason we looked at Carnegie is because the curriculum comes balanced. Ah. It has a great balance of procedural and um, conceptual. conceptual, and what we have found before Carnegie is that our teachers are very good at the procedural, mm -hmm. but we didn't have a good balance. A lot of the conceptual was missing. We didn't know what that looked like. We didn't know how to do that, and so the curriculum gives us a picture, a roadmap of what that looks like. Beautiful, and that's what we need as a roadmap, and so that it's consistent across the district, so that every kid is having the same quality math instruction. Awesome, Holly. About I love the um, in one of your podcasts. Um, I don't know if it's you or Dr. James uh, talked about having that common story, that mm. common example. And I, with the Carnegie, it's already the conceptual and procedural is balanced, but looking at those opening lessons, they engage that exploratory piece, gives the students something to think about when they're doing that procedural math. Mm -hmm. And that's conceptual understanding. Um, a lot of times we, as math teachers, throw out concrete, abstract, representational, and it's just so overwhelming. But when you get down to it, when you put a pencil to a paper, what's going through your mind? Because if the only thing going through your mind is what I do to one side, I do to the other side, and that, you're all in the abstract. And the kids don't have anything to grab a hold of. So using those engaged lessons, um, there's one coming up I was looking at uh, that talks about draining a pump, uh, draining a pool, uh. and then it goes into linear equations. And I've, the whole time you're doing the lessons, you're thinking about that linear, that uh, pool draining, and, and that's that conceptual piece that I, I really love with Carnegie. Nice, and kids can connect to that because you have to find something that can help them realize, oh, it's just like this or it's like that. Mm -hmm. I would need that if I was in a math class learning then, linear once you, equations. <laughs> once you own that example, you can take it with you year to year. Oh, I love every it. time you talk to me about equations, I'll be like, okay, there's a pool and we are draining it and the beginning point. And so uh, that conceptual to procedural, um, I think finding that balance sometimes 
is just looking for those um, misconceptions that may come up and being able to reference it back to that concrete example to say, well, would that happen if a pool was draining or would that happen? And, and that's that balance that we look for for our students' understanding. Beautiful. Have you all witnessed any examples? Because I know you go on a lot of instructional walks to kind of witness what's happening at the schools and making sure that implementation mm -hmm. of Carnegie is happening. Have you seen any examples, uh, good examples of the balance of conceptual and procedural? We have some teachers that are really getting the hang of it. Yay! Um, we uh, There's a, a teacher at Moody that I saw even last year in year one wow. who was really utilizing tools, patty paper, and actually the compass, and m really making kids get a visual, a concrete example of what they were doing before they got into the procedural. Mm -hmm. I saw the same thing at Kathy Middle School where she used the football field with manipulatives to great. really... Kids really, it was a game to them. And then when they did the math, sh the teacher said, I didn't even have to teach them anything. They already knew it from playing the game. Oh, that's wonderful. And that's what we're talking about. It mm -hmm. takes the teaching out and the learning is just kind of automatic. And once, once a teacher sees the shift from student learning, from teacher teaching to student learning, that was so, I believe you played that video at one of the board meetings mm -hmm. because it was such an aha moment. She said, I had not even taught the rules yet. And they were doing the math. Oh, wow. And we were like, yes, it's, it's possible. Oh, it's that's just, a good feeling as a teacher, too. It's mm -hmm. great. Wonderful. Mm -hmm. So I noticed in our math framework, and I'm going to, I'm, audience, I'm putting them on the spot right now. They do not know I'm going to do this. <laughs> but uh, we talked in the math framework committee how important wa it was not to use some buzzwords because we wanted everyone, all stakeholders, to understand. So I'm, we're going to play a game. Okay. I'm going to throw out a word, and I want you to tell me, either one of you, what would be like like a, uh, a, a word that a, just a regular person would know that's not a teacher and not an academic person. But so we can make these um, words that they use in that first belief, something that everybody can really understand. So one of the things that it said was fluency, while also developing fluency with procedural aspects of mathematics. So what do we mean when we talk about fluency in math? How can we make that simple? So... Uh, fluency in reading means um, practicing until mm -hmm. you can read it without mm -hmm. any mistakes, without pausing and re following the commas and the punctuation rules. So when we talk about math, I think it means, and I'm not a math person. So That's I'm okay. Gonna, That's all um, right. Um, I think it means using your like you already know your times tables so when you're when you're grasping at something you don't have to stop and and think about what might what multiplication means you can automatically go nine times three is 18 and you don't have to stop and do the multiplication in order to get to the problem that you're on so that would be a fluent that would be a fluent student in math yes. holly how did she do six times three is 18 but you nailed the oh rest. oh gosh <laughs> <laughs> As we have you, got to take that off. No, oh, no, my six gosh. Times three, <laughs> six times three is 18. Um, that was great. Um, whatever you said. And, I was um, trying so hard to think, what's a times table three. that I know? <laughs> um, that was, um, when, when you said fluency, I'm not going to lie. I went, oh, I'm glad I got my English person with me because I know fluency. Um, I was thinking about the times tables. And... Um, Many students struggle with memorizing mm -hmm. times tables. And there again, if we could get some of those concrete examples so that when you're trying to, I don't care if you count groups of uh, six groups of three or three groups of six, you always come up with 18. If you know there's more than one way to do it, it takes some of the pressure off just rote memorization. Ah. But when I think of the word fluency in math, I don't think of a place you hit I think of a process you go through so whatever you're fluent in today as long as you're more fluent tomorrow you're making that forward progress, progress. Yes. and that's fluency you're you're going to get to fluency and I loved your example because it's true um, I have students telling me I don't need to know my memory I don't need to memorize my facts uh, because I'm gonna get a calculator next year or whatever oh. year and I tell them if okay number one they're called handhelds now because oh, they're computers. I did not know that. TI handhelds. Yes, oh. we're, they're not a calculator. It, it's a computer. Um, and if you're using a TI or if you're using a handheld to figure out six times three, there's so much more out there. So that fluency is so important because you want to use that as a tool 
to get to the upper math, not to answer six times three or three times nine or whatever our number is. So fluency to me is just establishing where you are and working each day to gain a little more. Awesome. Okay, last one. Okay. Here we go. This one, and it, it kind of sounds the same, but I could be wrong. Fact automaticity. And that word right there is hard mm -hmm. to say. Fact automaticity. So what if somebody was reading this, what does that mean? I, I would go with the same definition. Right? Fact automaticity. Right. Um, we this year we're uh, using anchor charts. Okay. Uh, and the difference between a poster and an anchor chart a teacher creates a poster, a class creates an anchor chart. And I feel like with those anchor charts, that's what, say it again, fact, automaticity. automaticity. Yes. Um, I think that's what we're uh, driving with our students because when you have a question, you need to be able to look at that anchor chart and have that fact automaticity right mm. there so that you will then become automatic yourself. But And, and, and we've all seen it in the classroom. Oh, I like that you said automatic. That will help. That yes. We're, we're all taking a test, and you see a kid looking over at that poster that you've covered, and, but you know they're going back into the lesson when you reference Recall. that and that automaticity. Mm -hmm. Love it, love it. So last question, we're almost done ladies. You guys are doing fantastic. Um, being a part of the math committee, this was really a journey. We, we met with lots of people. Mm -hmm. I mean, we've been on what two, this is year two. So if you could sum up what it's been like in a phrase or a couple sentences, what has it been like to go through this whole journey in math and developing the math framework and now launching it? Can I go first? Because mm -hmm. it's on my, uh, um, last year was my first year in CCISD. So watching this process of community members, engineers, there were people in the room that had buy-in to this document and, and put in hours of prep before the meetings. Mm -hmm. And that was just such a rewarding experience to see what finally developed with everybody's thoughts. Um, going into the, um, that, having teachers in the room during that process when we when I would be in the uh, campuses or within a PD and talking and one of the teachers could give testimony to what was said in the especially like the balance to procedural um, that's real powerful because teachers listen to teachers oh yes and so having that buy-in uh, I just loved watching the um, process of it being built and now watching how we're uh, communicating to all stakeholders mm -hmm. that it, this is a living document that we are showing everyone not just okay check box we did it move on and yes that part this part's the exciting part yes it's last very year exciting. was the building yeah randy any thoughts um i agree i think it's um i see it as a as the frame i mean it's a true framework mm -hmm. and so what is happening i i, I would say it's intentionally on our part but a lot of the stakeholders see it as inadvertently. Like yesterday, a principal said, I've just noticed that everything y'all are doing is building on the same thing and going a little bit deeper. And I was like, yes. oh, Woo! that's what we're working. And, and it's the framework that's causing us to do mm -hmm. that. It's, it's, it's keeping us all grounded in the same thing. And so instead of anything new, we just keep going back to the framework. What do we need to hit now? What do we need to hit next? What do we need to learn now? And so all of that is just forcing us and it it's, might seem inadvertent to them, but it's very intentional on our part. And the fact that they're noticing it um, tells me we're doing the right thing. The example I think about is last year when Randy in one of our department meetings uh, said, we're going to do a PD on productive struggle. And we were all sitting there going, cool, that'll be awesome. And she said, we're doing it. And we were like, oh, okay, that's <laughs> even more awesome. Uh, can I have a book? Can I have a... And, and But it was so well received with the principals. And then a couple of months later, uh, Juan Jimenez came in and did Productive Struggle, and we were like, oh my gosh, this is awesome. Yes. So it's just having this framework and having that vision of where we're going, I think has been um, very instrumental. And I just want to add one more thing. Um, when I first read uh, Conceptual to Procedural, um, I thought about the awesome job that Carnegie, our Carnegie coaches are doing and are doing the math, which is our PLC time. Mm. Every six weeks, our teachers meet. And like you said, our teachers are amazing at procedural. Um, the um, Taking a procedural day, because you know tomorrow you're going to teach a lesson, Carnegie has taught us how to just take 
procedural activities and putting them into the lesson in an as-needed basis. And that the teachers have embraced because we're not saying don't do procedural, only do conceptual, like you started the podcast out, that balance. It's a balance, and yes. And do you know it's amazing when you tell students, I have some practice for you if you need it. They usually can master without that extra practice, whereas if you dedicate a whole day to practice, the entire room practices whether they need it or not. So I'm, I'm really enjoying the Carnegie coaches and how they're putting – um, action-based steps that are going to our classroom that's creating that balance with conceptual and procedural. Well, awesome. It's all about balance, ladies. Thank mm -hmm. you so much for being here today. And I'm Carrie. I'm Holly. I'm Randy. And we're Getting, getting to, to the, the Core. core.